Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome to another session of the Doctrine and Covenants Roundtable. This session we'll be talking about section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is the longest uh, section that we have in this scripture. Joining me this hour are distinguished professors from Brigham Young University. The first is Dr. Craig Osler. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. Okay, we also joined this hour by Dr. John Livingston. Good to be here, Susan. Welcome, John. We are also joined by Dr. Lawrence Flake. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Well, this section of the Doctrine and Covenants, notice it follows directly after the sections in which uh, Joseph Smith was in Liberty Jail, and we learned about his sufferings. It's now two years later. During those two years, Joseph escaped from Liberty Jail and has gone up to a mosquito-infested swampland and founded a town that will ultimately be known as Beautiful Nauvoo. Craig, can you tell us more of that as we now go into verses, uh, the first verses, and learn what the Lord is telling His prophet? I would look at this as kind of the Lord's <clears throat> uh, plan for Nauvoo, as He reveals to Joseph what He would like Nauvoo to become. And also to kind of remind Joseph who he is, this first verse, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, I am well pleased with your offering and acknowledgments which you have made, for unto this end I have raised you up, and reminding him how he got to where he's at even, that I might show forth my wisdom through the weak things of the earth. <laughs> Joseph is the weak thing. <laughs> Just a little up. reminder. Uh -huh. <laughs> then he continues, Your prayers are acceptable before me, and in answer to them, I say unto you that you are now called immediately to make a solemn proclamation of my gospel and of this stake which I have planted to be a cornerstone of Zion. And, I, you know, that's, that's interesting to, to refer, you know, a cornerstone has three major functions, I guess. One is kind of a foundation you build things on. Another, a cornerstone gives you direction so you can lay the building straight. Square. Yeah, yeah. It make sure it's squared up completely. And uh, the other is it kind of ties the building together. And I thought of what happens in Nauvoo. That's a perfect description, is much of what the saints are going to do after Joseph's martyred is built on the foundation of that which happens with the temple mm -hmm. and with the doctrines that are elucidated and clarified in Nauvoo. Uh, it, it, they understand better what a city stake of Zion is to be like because this is really the first place they've been able to, to actually develop a city on the city stake plat that Joseph has drawn up to know how that's mm -hmm. done. And so he continues, speaking of this cornerstone, which shall be polished with refinement which is after the similitude of a palace. And I think, at least I've heard Nauvoo often, even to this day, referred to as the gem on the Miss Mississippi. Is that? Could I just read Joseph Smith's words as he explained the he Hebrew origin of the word? He, he said it was, it signifies a beautiful situation, a place uh, carrying with it also the idea of rest. Uh, and I think that's a good description of it, and especially the first few years there, it really was a rest for them compared with what they had been through. From persecution. And what, yeah. and, <laughs> right. And that's They're the only way hard. it was a rest. <laughs> In a sense, you know, it's a rest today. You consider what the brethren have done with the city of Nauvoo, yeah, rebuilding the temple, and of course, people go there to recreate. You yeah. know, we go there to see and learn, and it really has become a wonderful cornerstone. Mm -hmm. Think of what you put in a cornerstone and how the restoration of Nauvoo is, you know, the it, cornerstone. It is there. Uh, as we read these early verses, we learn that Joseph Smith is told to make a solemn proclamation of the gospel to the president, governors, and rulers of nations. Uh, did that happen? Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen during the prophet's lifetime. Uh, there's quite a, a history of 
him trying to get it organized and trying to get it accomplished, but uh, the press of other concerns and the persecutions and so forth, it really never did take place. But uh, true to the charge, the Quorum of the Twelve uh, did accomplish that after his death. And in 1845 uh, it was that uh, Parley P. Pratt mostly was uh, writing for the Quorum of the Twelve. They all, of course, uh, were involved, but he wrote the proclamation uh, to the world, uh, which uh, fulfilled this uh, command. And uh, it was published in England by Wilford Woodruff, who was there at the time. And uh, it is bold. Uh, it, it really is remarkable. It's, it's addressed to the kings of the world, to the president of the United States of America, to the governors of, several, of the several states, and to the rulers and peoples of all nations. And then the, uh, they just launch right into it. Know ye that the kingdom of God has come. Uh, as has been predicted by ancient prophets and prayed for in all ages. Uh, and the great Elohim has uh, been pleased once more to speak from heaven. Uh, and by the, the, these means, uh, the great eternal high priesthood is restored to the earth. Uh, and it goes on in that vein. Maybe John has it on his computer. You might want to share some things. But just one other thought here. This, uh, they are not shy to announce that uh, and uh, we now bear witness that the coming of the Messiah is at hand, and not many years hence the nations and, and their kings shall see him coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So it's a glorious, powerful proclamation. A yeah, wonderful fulfillment. As we continue on, you'll notice that uh, the Lord speaks of Hiram, David W. Patton, even Joseph Smith Sr., and uh, many things about uh, the greatness of their lives, their integrity. And then finally, Craig, we come to where he's talking about a, a need to build a Nauvoo house as <laughs> well as a Nauvoo temple. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I've looked, you know, if you go to Nauvoo, they're the two places I want to, to look for. One, because they're both been, have been built or were built originally under command of God. And it helps us to see that the saints may not be of the world, but they don't intend to leave the world because when the, the Nauvoo house, verse 23, indicates it's to be a, a house for strangers that come from afar to lodge therein. And, of course, with Nauvoo being kind of a swampy area, they might be kind of concerned about health issues when people come to visit. And two, uh, I've been in large cities before, and you now and again fear for your safety, <laughs> your physical safety in, in a large city. And he indicates, he says, we need a place, verse 23, where the weary traveler may find health and safety while he shall contemplate the word of the Lord. And I thought that not only happened in Nauvoo, uh, but in Salt Lake City. As the saints come here, they had the Hotel Utah for a time. Mm -hmm. Now the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, a beautiful place of health and safety where the weary traveler <laughs> may come and then contemplate what it is that the Lord's people have been asked to do. And I think it has the, the, the same purpose that this Nauvoo house had. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways, I look at Nauvoo, that Salt Lake City in, is just simply Nauvoo transported a little less than a thousand miles to the west. A, a temple at the center laid out like Nauvoo, a Nauvoo house. And the hotels right across the street from the temple. Uh -huh. yeah. Jumping ahead to verse 60, just the description there describes the Nauvoo house as a delightful habitation, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, what the Lord had in mind. Okay, now, John, was that Nauvoo house ever really finished? You know, it wasn't really finished. As a matter of fact, uh, much of the foundation, only part of the foundation really is covered with a house today. The death of Joseph Smith, of course, and the exodus of the saints meant that the Nauvoo house really never was completed. But it's a unique structure and the cornerstone, the things that were put in there are still, still of interest to us today. The prophet wanted it finished, even yeah. with the temple. He said it was, it was just as important. And I think it has to do with the way people look at us. We know that the Lord has his eye on kings, magistrates, rulers, and the influence for good that they can do for the kingdom going forth. And I think it would have had a different story had they been able to finish and it. And I think, too, the Lord wants us to be hospitable, yeah. you know, right. to welcome people. Okay, and so the structure we see on the spot then built 1872, more the uh, Biteman House, as opposed to the Nauvoo house that the Lord is speaking of in this section. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to, to, 
yeah. describe it different. I never thought of that before. Okay. Isn't it true, Susan, that the prophet and Hiram were buried in the basement of that house right. for a period of time? Right, for a period of time for they moved around. over to the bee house and then, of course, where they are today. Well, Lawrence, uh, we're also commanded to build a temple. Uh, tell us about this magnificent structure. Uh, as I look at the temple restored, it's so obvious that the saints uh, love the Lord. You compare their small uh, brick houses and you see this magnificent temple and you know it is truly a house of the Lord. Well, it is a remarkable thing that uh, they had left a temple that they had uh, built with their, their blood and tears and uh, now the Lord is inviting them to build another temple and, and they build this uh, beautiful facility and it is a major the major work of it, interestingly enough, as emphasized in this section, is for the dead. Uh, and specifically, baptism for the dead is uh, spoken of here uh, very strongly by the Lord and the importance that that would be to have that temple. Uh, and uh, they go to it, as we can see from history, and see all that they put into it and, and almost get it finished before they leave. And uh, it has a sad ending of the building, but now we see that glorious uh, almost resurrection uh, as we see the temple on the very spot as it's been restored. Yeah, I, I don't think any of us can forget the day, uh, June 27th, so many years after the martyrdom, when President Gordon B. Hinckley dedicated this uh, marvelous new house of the Lord. What a great day. It's impressive the strong language that the Lord uses in directing the building of the temple. If you come to about verse 31, if we go into it a little ways, I grant unto you a sufficient time to build a house unto me. During this time, your baptism shall be acceptable unto me, but behold, at the end of this appointment, your baptisms for your dead shall not be acceptable unto me. And if you do not these things at the end of the appointment, ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. Wow, what a punctuation mark yeah. for the building okay, of that a, temple. And a need for all of us to begin to search after mm -hmm. our dead if we well, haven't begun yeah. to. There, there's a, a change, I think, too, in the way the saints understand uh, the reality that's here, and that is that most people during their mortal sojourn will never hear the fullness of the gospel. Most people never have an opportunity to receive the ordinances of the gospel because of that. And he knows that the really the crowning work is temple work. That we need temple work done and look what has gone today. It's not a temple that they're building, but you know, I imagine we'll see the days of hundreds of temples, and the purpose is, has to do with uh, many blessings that come to people as, as if you reach through or beyond the veil. And the great experiences, I think, of our youth that they have as they do baptisms for the dead and, uh, and working with the youth, it brings tears to my eyes when I, I see them coming dressed in white and so humble and having these experiences of knowing they're doing a work for those that are on the other side of the veil. I think it's interesting, too, how, how the Lord talks even beyond baptism. If you come down here in verse 37, 38, again, verily I say unto you, how shall your washings be acceptable? Mm -hmm. Look at 39. But your anointings, your baptisms for the dead, your solemn assemblies, your memorials, he's clearly pointing forward to a more complete endowment in a temple. Right. And, of uh, course, we see that. that will soon await these saints there yes. in Nauvoo before they flee to go west. Yes, I've so, noticed... Uh, excuse so interesting, uh, verse 36, that it, he's talking about the fact that baptisms now will be performed in other places besides Zion, and specifically it says in Jerusalem. And I thought, my word, that's incredible to think baptisms for the dead in Jerusalem. And then I thought, hey, that's where they began. That's the <laughs> first reference we have is Paul talking about baptism yeah. for the dead in Jerusalem, and okay. it'll be restored. Lawrence, maybe also take up the idea that it appears the saints are now being excused by the Lord from building this temple in Jackson County at this time. I think that that... Uh, Let's see, that's verse uh, 49. 49. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, you know, sometimes people look and see uh, what you could interpret in a negative way, I guess, as failure after failure. We try to, did it, try, try to do it, and it didn't happen. And Jackson County is one of those places where great plans, but it just didn't materialize. And some people would see that as Joseph Smith not having uh, the true revelation. But the fact is, uh, as the Lord points out here, that when the sons of men go forth with all their might and with all they uh, have to 
perform that work and cease not uh, in their diligence uh, and their enemies come upon them and hinder them from performing that work, behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more. In other words, the Lord is not going to take their agency away and keep uh, opposition from happening. And he does not require it of the sons of men anymore. And to me, that verse seems to even personally for uh, each of us. Sometimes we have something we really want to do and that the Lord would like to have us do, but we just can't because of maybe a physical handicap. I think of young men that cannot serve a mission because of some limitation. And, and the, 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 the letter from the first presidency says to the bishops and stake presidents, tell them they're honorably excused. Uh, that's touching to me. I like verse 51 where a few words in he said, I accepted the offering of those. Yeah. It's just as if he's capped it and wants to know that just because you cannot get it done, you're not condemned. The Lord understands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As it goes on, verses 56 to 83, it talks about uh, back to building this Nauvoo house, and that's one of those that didn't get done. Yeah. You know, when, when we're back to it... Um, feelings about that, especially the cornerstone, maybe might be a, a topic here for that. I, I, love the, uh, I love the fact that here the Lord shows that he's a businessman too. <laughs> he understands stock and investments and limitations and limited companies and things like that. But verse 60, let the name of that house be called Nauvoo House. Let it be a delightful habitation for man and a resting place for the weary traveler that he may again contemplate the glory of Zion and the glory of this, the cornerstone thereof. Again, back to the idea that somehow the Nauvoo period of church history represents kind of the cornerstone, the foundation. And like Craig said, boy, you've got a, a perfect square corner to build from. And whether it's endowment, temples, missionary work, we really can take the roots of it back to Nauvoo. And if we look at ourselves, we, we'd call ourselves a Nauvoo church more than a Kirtland church. Yeah. <laughs> because Nauvoo with the temple work and work for the dead, that, that's what we associate with the work of yeah. the kingdom today. In a sense, we turn to major corner. Yes, that's in a good Nauvoo. Okay, yeah. as, as we continue and we turn this corner, we find that Father Joseph Smith Sr. has died and prior to his death, he's called in various family members and given them blessings. In a blessing recorded by Lucy Max Smith, uh, Hiram received from his father, it, it was said, I now, I now seal upon your head the patriarchal power, and you shall bless the people. This is my dying blessing upon your head in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we begin to see this now literally fulfilled as we look at verses 84 through 96. Uh, Craig, would you like to share some of those with us? Sure. Uh, at this time, uh, Hiram then has been serving in the first presidency of the church. And so he's released from that call. And in his stead, uh, William Law is called to be the second counselor to the prophet Joseph Smith. For you, William came from Upper Canada, near Toronto area. Well, he doesn't end up good, good though, start. John. <laughs> <Did he? Yeah. laughs> Canadians. And uh, he is uh, given in verse 89 a responsibility to, if you'll notice toward the end, to publish the new translation of what we would refer to as the Bible. Now, because of other concerns he had, some of them taking him away from the church and becoming enemy to Joseph, it's not published in that time. You know, I think it's interesting, beginning of verse 89, it's almost as if the Lord can see that coming. The if? Yep, if he will do my will, let him henceforth hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph, and he didn't do it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to take William Law and uh, John C. Bennett and circle all of the ifs, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the ifs just didn't happen with them. Uh, okay, I'd, them. I'd probably also add in Alma W. Babbitt, this right. side oh. worships the cold, golden calf where you get Joseph Smith in Carthage Jail asking Uncle John Smith to go get the help of attorney Alma W. Babbitt to assist Joseph. And although Babbitt was then serving as a branch president there in Ramus, his comment when asked, will you help Joseph? His comment was, you're too late. I've already been hired by the other side. <laughs> so you kind of look at what's going on to these men, the council, will they listen? And then you contrast that with 
this great man, Hiram Smith. Yeah. Okay. Just, just a thought about uh, uh, Alman Babbitt. He, uh, he did uh, come back into the church after he he'd did. been excommunicated, came to Utah, but he still had trouble following counsel. And one of the things that he was counseled to do was when coming back from Washington, D.C., to travel with a large group of people. And he, he wouldn't do it. He was alone, and he was one of the few Mormons ever killed by Indians crossing the plains because of not following the counsel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, That's tell good. us, uh, the ultimate contrast is this very faithful man, Hiram Smith. In fact, earlier in the Revelation, uh, in verse 15, the Lord had addressed Hiram earlier. He said, Again, verily I say unto you, Blessed is my servant Hiram Smith, for I, the Lord, love him because of the integrity of his heart and because he loveth that which is right before me saith the Lord. No ifs in there, by the way. Right. And uh, these verses, back in verse 91, sometimes are problematic. Probably good to discuss them a little bit. In that Hiram's actually being called to two offices in the priesthood, not one. In fact, I think in verse 1, where it refers to Hiram taking the office of priesthood, it's not the same and patriarch. It means there's two. The office of priesthood is going to be that of standing next to Joseph is the what is known as assistant or associate president of the church, an office only held by one other person that we have any record of. Oliver Cowdery. Oliver, yeah, Oliver yep. Cowdery. And it helps us to discern, uh, we've talked about this before, John, you and I, have, that the patriarch does not hold keys. And uh, so in verse 92, when it says he holds the keys of patriarchal blessings, he doesn't mean priesthood keys. He means that the kind of key that unlocks the heavens yes. so that you can receive revelation. But differently in verse 94 now, it's referring to his presiding priesthood office where he becomes a prophet, seer, and revelator unto the church. And that's one reason I understand he's in Carthage jail with the prophet Joseph Smith as a second witness where Oliver Cowdery would have been there possibly had he been faithful. This is a, a wonderful line from that blessing you referred to, Sister Black, on uh, the prophet blessing Hiram, or his father blessing him. He said, you shall be firm as the pillars of heaven unto the end of your days. What a great line. And his brother, Joseph, uh, made this comment. He said uh, that his brother possessed the mildness of a lamb, the integrity of a Job, and in short, the meekness and humility of Christ. So we have a remarkable man filling both of those priesthood offices. And we see a son and then a grandson and, and others too that have had such important uh, responsibilities in the kingdom and they often refer back to Hiram. He, he yeah. definitely is a good taproot and for a family. A, even a uh, great grandson serving in the Quorum of the Twelve now. Right. Uh, Elder Ballard. Ballard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, as we continue on, we now learn that Hiram is called to many off to uh, two offices then mm -hmm. in this section. But we also find that others are being called. Uh, uh, here we get so many of those named now in the Doctrine and Covenants. I, I did a little uh, study just to see. Actually, I looked at your book, uh, Who's Who in the Doctrine and Covenants, to find how many people are named in the Doctrine and Covenants. There are 156, including three sisters. And uh, interestingly enough, this section uh, refers to 60 of the 156. So it's uh, really loaded with personnel and very interesting to see where, where, what happened to them and where they went. and <laughs> So Susan owes uh, this, this revelation for her work, <laughs> <laughs> all the names that are there. I personally am grateful for all of these people. <laughs> well, okay, we get uh, such things as we've got uh, stake being organized. Well, John, you want to tell us about what's going on here? It's uh, the priesthood, they're, everything's being put in order. The, the Lord is organizing a stake here in, in Nauvoo. He's setting up, uh, well, he refers to the traveling council, of course, who are the Quorum of the Twelve, and then the standing high council that is there. He's mentioning elders quorum, high priests uh, quorums, and, and this is really where we see the, uh, uh, the stake president become the president of the Melchizedek priesthood in his stake. Um, Keys are being handed. Uh, look at verse, if you go all the way down to 123. Verily I say unto you, I now give unto you the officers belonging to my priesthood. 
that ye may hold the keys thereof, even the priesthood, which is after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, Hiram is granted uh, the office of patriarch in 124. But my goodness, all these people, all these names, all these callings, again, back to the cornerstone of the Nauvoo period of church history here. You know, I think it's interesting that the 70 also seem to take hold more in Nauvoo than they've had opportunity to anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons the gospel goes forth from Nauvoo more to the world. Specifically, before this time, you have the 12 being mentioned, yeah. which are a little bit different 12 than they'd had years previous because you've had apostasy. And in verse 129, you see these names of these great men who went to England on a mission. And what we have... 30,000 saints, at least, I'd imagine, over in England, uh, within this decade, at least, mm -hmm. because of the work the 12 have done. We have the 70 now who are also being sent with them or by them to places in the world, and it's going forth marvelously. Yeah. In Nauvoo, there were 35 quorums of 70. I thought it was so interesting. It's, Excuse it's me. Huge. And a hall that's built for <laughs> them. They have a too. museum upstairs to show what they brought home. Right. <laughs> when the, when the, the Lord lists the Quorum of the Twelve there, I thought it was touching that he lists one who is dead, mm -hmm. uh, David Patton, who had given his life as a martyr for the church, and that makes the point of, behold, his pr uh, priesthood, no man taketh from him. So he's really still a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. He's just on the other side of the veil. I thought that was interesting. In fact, verse 19 earlier, the Lord referred to David W. Patton. In verse 19, he's referring to the work of Lyman White. He says that hopefully he could be like David W. Patton. He said, who is with me at this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elder Patton kind of holds a, a special place in our hearts because of his faithfulness to the very end of his life. Well, good. That's a wonderful way to end uh, this great section. I thank you for your wonderful contributions. We've learned this hour about the Nauvoo House, the Nauvoo Temple, the calling of Patriarch, and many other, uh, many other callings in the church. Thank you. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.